Hey, good morning, Northbridge. So glad to have you with us. How are you guys doing today? Everybody warming up, your fingers starting to tingle a little bit. Man, we are really stepping into late fall, early winter. And I personally, I'm really loving it. It's sweater weather. I don't know about you, but it's my favorite kind of season. If this is your first time joining us today, my name's Nolan. I'm one of the worship leaders here. We're so glad to have you with us. And uh, to let you know how glad we are that you're here today, we have a gift for you. So if you're joining us online, there's going to be a little tab that says, I'm new. You can click that, and we'd love to get that into your hands. And if you're joining us here in the room, there's a table out in the lobby. Just head there after service, say, I'm new, and we'll get that gift to you. Um, speaking of if you're new, if you're a young adult and this is your first time attending or maybe you've been here a couple times, we just want to let you know we have an event coming up next week on the 21st. It's going to be at Top Golf. 2.30. If you'd love to come join us, you can head to northbridge.org to sign up. We're going to have uh, food. It's going to be two hours of fun, and it's at a low cost. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, if you want more information, you can talk to me after service, too. I'll be uh, help running that on that day. As far as this morning goes, we're going to be together for about an hour. We're going to spend some time singing together, and then we're going to finish out our current series. It's called Reassembly Required with our teaching pastor, Andy Stanley. But before we get to that, why don't you stand, just greet somebody around you, and we'll get to it. Sing it out. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, and you are my portion, and you are my hiding place. Oh, I believe. You are the way, sing it out, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe through every blessing, through every truth today to proclaim together. Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, God. You are everything. Come on, sing this out. It's a new horizon. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, yeah, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. Oh, all my fears and doubts, yeah, they can all come to. Because they can't stay long. Yes, you are the truth. 
today So how stand With arms high and heart up in In all of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours You stood before creation Eternity in your hand And you spoke the earth into motion My soul choose to believe that Jesus is the way, we're, we're truly choosing to give him everything. So what might it look like today for you to give God your heart? For you to have a posture of praise that says, I surrender to you. You know, maybe it's raising your hand. Maybe it's just closing your eyes and, and, and uh, bowing your head before him. Or maybe it's just simply singing for the first time. You know, whatever that step might be, I, I just encourage you to take it today. If only to just draw closer to him. Come on, let's sing this together. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. I am his, yours. Come on, give him everything today.
God, we come before you today, people who are broken, people who don't have all the answers. Before you and almighty God who created everything, who made us all special and unique, who loves us dearly. And God, we wanna say you can have everything. We surrender to you our heart, our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our fears, and we believe that you are who you say you are. Thank you so much for sending your son to die and resurrect that we might have life. In the name we pray, amen. Hey, you can have a seat this morning. Thank you so much for singing with us. Thank you, Nolan, Heather, Allison, and band. You guys are awesome. Aren't they awesome, guys? Good. Great start to the morning. I love being here with you all on Sunday mornings and worshiping together. There's something about singing in community that is just awesome, and uh, I'm so grateful to be able to do that with you. And same with you online. If you guys are joining us for the first time, again, we're so grateful that you're here. My name is Jason, and I am the service programming director here at the church, and I also, also oversee the guest services. So if you walk in on Sundays, you'll see me out there with our yellow shirt team a lot. So thanks to that team for serving this morning. Thanks to the band for, for singing. And uh, I, I just love to, right? It's something we get to do each and every Sunday. And it's, it's such a great way to just express to God our, our, our thankfulness to him. And so again, if you're new, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If you're new online, uh, we got awesome hosts for you today. We got Dan and Julie on there. So what's up, Dan, Julie? If you guys actually want to turn around, there's a camera right in the back of the room. You can kind of wave and say hi there. So yeah, what's up online? We're so glad that you're with us too. Uh, there, there's some, a lot of cool stuff going on in, in the heart of the church we want to share with you. But one way to really get connected online is there's a chat going on right there. And I know that Dan and, and Julie and I saw uh, Donnie on there talking. So there's a chat already going on online. Please, please use that chat, utilize that. That's going to allow you to feel more connected here at the church. And speaking of getting connected, we have a lot going on this week. So this Thursday, November 18th, we have an event called Connect. And that's going to be Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. right here at the church. It'll be back in our upstreet room right across the hall in family ministry there. And I'll tell you what, it's an awesome, awesome event. It allows us uh, to ask some questions about the church, to hear the story of how the church started, to get to know those of you that are sitting in the rows together here. You get to know each other a little bit more, and you get to know the staff a little bit more. And I got to have some great conversations this past month. We had one in October, and it, it, was, it was fantastic. And so I got to have awesome conversations and heard some stories from some new folks. I know that Wes and Brooke, I saw you guys come in. Kenny and Gail, I saw you guys come in. We had some awesome conversations, and I feel like I know you guys now. And so when I see you come in, we get to have, what's up, guys? We get to have some conversation, and I hope you feel the same way. I hope you feel connected in that way. And that's exactly what this event provides. It prevents an opportunity for you guys to get to know each other, to get to know the staff, and eat some awesome desserts. We're going to have nothing but cakes there again. And so if you haven't had them yet, you've got to try them. They're in Cranberry. It's a little cakery over there. And we have these massive cupcakes from them. So don't hesitate. These are don't-miss opportunities. There's an option uh, today. You can go out, if you're in the room, into the lobby, to the guest services table there. There's an iPad. You can directly sign up for that uh, event there. If you're joining us online, again, there's going to be a link that pops up. You can click on that and register there. Another way we can get connected as well is through service, right? If we serve together, we get to have conversations together too. So November 20th, our Be Rich Serve Saturday is coming up with World Vision. And World Vision is awesome. They, they uh, like package goods and clothes and stuff that just people need uh, to send to, to people all over the world. Uh, that are in need of those things. And so we would meet there from 9 to noon on Saturday. Uh, we would package these things and just hang out arm in arm, trying to get to know each other a little bit more. And so both of those things, again, you can sign up in the lobby today or you can sign up online. Uh, those of you that are joining us online, just, just go ahead and do that. There's also a QR code. I don't know if you want to throw that up, Sue, if anyone wants to take a picture of that uh, and, and log in and register that way. But as far as today goes, like Nolan said, uh, we're, we're in our part four, which is the last week of our series, Reassembly Required, with Andy Stanley. And before we get to that, we're going to have a slide come up here in the room, and uh, you're going to see something pop up online as a way to give. And that's another way we can continue to worship here at the church, is just giving and trusting God with our finances. So those are going to pop up, and we're going to hit part four of Reassembly Required.
So as we've um, said throughout this series that repairing a broken or disrupted or awkward or damaged relationship, um, it's not easy. Um, and oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes we, we actually want to. I mean, if we could just push a button and the relationship was fixed or the relationship was better, um, we would. Um, and even if we don't really want to, oftentimes we know we ought to want to. You ever ought to want to it's like you know if you ever pray and say god i i know what i should ask you for but i don't but i don't really think that's what i want so i want to want to what i what i want to want to want so when it comes to relationships we want them to be fixed or at least we know we ought to want them to be fixed but it's just so difficult and one of the reasons it's so difficult is honestly we just don't know how to so want to is one thing but how to is something else and it's not intuitive as we said throughout the series series um we we think we, you know it's intuitive but re- repairing a broken relationship is not intuitive. And part of the reason it's not is because repairing a broken relationship requires something that does not come natural to any of us. It requires humility. And we are born, we come into the world anti, you know, resisting humility, putting somebody else first, you know, making ourselves small, going to that smaller place. So because it kind of resists, you know, our nature resists it, and we don't know how to do it. Oftentimes those relationships, they just kind of dangle out there in this sense of awkwardness. And for some of you, your strained or broken relationship with somebody you don't see very often, so it's not front of mind. In fact, if you've been tracking with us in this series, you're kind of looking forward to it being over so you can put them back over in that box where you've kept them for years until I started talking about it. And suddenly you find yourself thinking about them and your mom or your husband or your wife or a friend is like, hey, maybe you're like, and like nope, 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 nope. We just, we just... Resist it. And the other reason this is so difficult is since it's not intuitive, um, and a lot of us have never even seen this modeled well, it, it's something we have to learn. It's a learned skill, which means somebody has to learn us, right? Teach us how to do it. And uh, hopefully this series has given you some handles or some steps in doing that. But again, the series, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a series. There's, there's so much more to it. But ideally, seeing this modeled is so helpful because, as you know, some things are really more caught than taught. So if you're a parent or you're a grandparent, okay, and I, this isn't going to be like a message on parenting, but I just want to say something about this. It is so important for you to teach your children how to repair a damaged or broken relationship. And maybe the primary reason you should teach them or model for them what it looks like to, dan- to repair a broken relationship is so that someday they will know how to repair their relationship with you. Yeah. You're like, oh, that could never happen between me and my kids. It will. It's just going to be strained. And then think about this. If they don't know what to do, they won't know what to do. And it's going to impact you. And you say, well, Andy, that's pretty self-serving. Teach your kids how to, you know, repair a damaged relationship so they know how to repair a relationship with their own parents. But it's not self-serving at all. Here's why I say that. that. Their relationship with you, you know this because of your personal history. Your children's relationship with you will be reflected in their future relationships, right? I mean, the damage that's done in a home, we just, we become a carrier. We carry that with us into the other relationships. So one of the best investments, if you have children, one of the best investments you can make in the future of your children, and in fact, this is a multi-generational investment. You have no idea where this is gonna land or how well this will serve them or how long this will serve them. One of the best things we can do is teach our kids how to repair a damaged relationship. And one of the best things you can do in this regard, and I'm gonna move on, is if you have ever done this successfully or you have ever tried and failed in this, you should share those epic stories with your kids. So again, they're not only gonna watch you try at home, but they're gonna hear how it worked out, how it didn't work out, what you wish you had done. So don't hide those things from your kids. It's so important that we model and we teach it um, for our kids. And I'll tell you, again, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna tell you where to start with your children. It all begins with a personal pronoun. You remember those? The personal pronouns. You have not thought about this in years and years and years unless you homeschool your kids (laughs) and you're so grateful for teachers now, aren't you? Anyway, personal uh, pronouns. So uh, here's why I say that. When when one of our kids, you know, would mistreat or be unkind to one of our other kids, we we have three kids, they're all 20 months apart by accident or providence. We don't know exactly how that worked, but they're all 20 months apart. So they're really um, close in age. And that one of them would do something unkind to their brother or sister, we would say, like every good parent, okay, apologize, apologize. And their response would be so heartfelt. They would say, sorry. 
sorry, right? Just sorry. It was so heartfelt. We, we were, it would bring us to tears that our children, they just love each other. Sorry, you know? And we wouldn't let them get by with it and you shouldn't let them get by with it either and you shouldn't try to get by with this. We insisted on that personal pronoun. We said, no, not sorry, I'm sorry. This is one of the earliest lessons in humility. It's owning what you've done. One word doesn't get it done, that personal pronoun, I'm sorry. Then, of course, um, somewhere around middle school, it went more like this. Okay, tell your brother you're sorry. Brother, you're sorry, right? (laughs) Which is the point. Okay, this isn't intuitive. It's, you know, it works against our human nature, right? And it's why we're talking about it. So today we are actually wrapping up our four-part series, Reassembly Required, Reassembly Required, a beginner's guide. And remember, it's just a beginner's guide. There's so much more to this. A beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships. Now, throughout the series, if you haven't been with us, if you're just tuning in for the first time, there's been a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is this, that when it comes to repairing or reassembling adult relationships, adult relationships, the goal, and this, is, this isn't intuitive either, The goal is not reconciliation. The goal is no regret. The goal is not reconciliation because you don't have control of all the parts. Repairing a toy, if you have all the broken pieces, no problem. Repairing a dish, no problem. But when it comes to repairing a relationship, we don't have access to all the pieces, all the broken pieces, because it's another person. So the goal isn't reconciliation because if the goal is reconciliation, that's an agenda for the other person. You know, we are gonna reconcile. I'm gonna keep coming at you till we're reconciled. So I can put a check in that box. Well, agendas always undermine the health of a relationship. Agendas always, always, always create distance. It's why you can be friendly with your boss, but you two aren't going to ever be like friends, friends, the way that some of your friends, friends are because your, your boss has an agenda. Of course, he or she has an agenda. And it doesn't mean there's a character issue. It means there's an agenda. And an agenda is like a third party in a relationship. So the goal isn't, by golly, we're going to reconcile if it kills, you know, no. The goal is that you go to bed every night and that you go to, you know, get to the end of your life or maybe the end of the potential for this relationship and you have no regrets. The goal is knowing you've done everything you could possibly do and that you continue doing it as long as you possibly can. Because reconciliation, it's a posture as we're gonna see. And of course, it's a process. It's dynamic, there are always moving parts, it's ongoing. And the win is to maintain somewhat of an open door policy, assuming, and I'm gonna come back to this, assuming it's safe. So we look briefly at a verse the Apostle Paul um, left us with last time, and it's such a powerful verse. It's the one I would really encourage you to memorize. If this is an issue that, you know, once the series is over, it's like, okay, I need, I don't wanna lose sight of this. Just put this verse somewhere, because it's a constant reminder. Here's what he wrote, he said, if it is possible, because he's a realist. He, he lives in the real world. He understands we don't have access to all the pieces. If it is, you're not holding all the cards, right? If it is possible, then he doubles down as far as it depends on you. And there's a cool little Greek thing going on here in the Greek text. Really, he's, he's really saying, if you've got it in you, if you've got the grit and the determination, if you're ready for it, if you think you're up to this, be at peace with everyone. Your, your English text says live at peace with everyone. I like the word be, the Greek text can, can go either way, but be at peace insinuates, you know what? I'm gonna do everything I can. You may never be at peace with me. You may avoid me every time you see me. You may rehearse those narratives in your mind for the rest of your life as to why it's my fault. But on my end, as far as it's possible in terms of the things I control, as far as it depends on me, I'm gonna do everything I can to know at the end of every day, that I've done everything I can. I'm gonna be at peace with you. I'm gonna do everything in my power. He's saying, do everything in your power to remove every obstacle you possibly can from that relationship. Because reconciliation begins with us, regardless of who initiated 
the fuss. So we've said throughout the series, it requires four decisions and we've covered the first two. I'll review them real quick. The first decision was this. I will get back to not get back at. I will get back to not get back at. I am taking retribution off the table. I am not going to pay them back. I'm going to lean toward, I'm going to try to get back to rather than get back at. Just like, and this is, if you're a Jesus follower, this is the the root. This is where all this emanates from. Just like our heavenly father did for us. In fact, a few weeks ago, some of us were together and I shared this with you, but not all of you've heard it. The, the verse that follows the most famous verse in the whole Bible, the most famous verse in the Bible is John three sixteen. The verse that follows that goes right to the heart of this first decision. Here's what it says. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to get back at us. That God did not send Jesus into the world to pay us back. Just the opposite. He did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save or rescue the world through him. That God came through Christ to your rescue in spite of you. And then throughout the New Testament, your heavenly father says to you and he says to me, I want you to to do for others what I've done for you. I want you to follow me. I want you to follow my example. And immediately we throw up all kinds of things. Yeah, but what about, what about, what about? And this is why the New Testament's so powerful. The words of Jesus are so powerful. The words of the apostle Paul are so powerful. It's like our heavenly father's going, wait, wait, wait. I'm not asking you to do this because they deserve it. I'm not asking you to do this because you have time for it. I'm asking you to do this as a reflection of what I have done for you, which means if you're not a Christian or you're not a Jesus follower, this is optional. And I hope, some of what we talk about is helpful because you'll be better off if you try to reconcile with people. But for Jesus followers, this isn't optional. This is, this is supposedly who we are and it's what we do. It's the way we do life. The, the apostle Paul, and I was hoping to spend some time in this passage. I'm just gonna read it to you because it's, it, it, again, it's so on point. After the apostle Paul explains to his audience on what God through Christ has done for us. Listen to how he wraps it up. He says this, all of this, everything I've just said to you, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the assignment of reconciliation. Your English text says the ministry of reconciliation, but the word ministry is so churchy, okay? And the Greek term here wasn't churchy because the Greek term was existed before there was a church. It really means the assignment or the service of reconciliation that he, he's basically saying, you are to do for others. This is just kind of the, the golden rule played out, except it's the platinum rule. It's doing to others as I have done for you through Christ. He says, I just want you to do for others what I've done for you. What, then he says this, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. And here's the, here's the tension, not counting people's sins against them. In other words, your heavenly father reconciled with you and he didn't count your sin against you. It was mostly your fault. In fact, let's just be honest. If we're talking about God, it was all our fault. I mean, he had no slice of the pie. And he decided, you know what? I'm gonna come for you because I love you. And I'm not gonna count what you did against you. And he says, now, come on. If I've done that for you, can, can you not at least attempt to do that for the people around you, not counting their sins against him. And he has, again, and he has committed to us, those of us who claim to be Christians, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. One of the reasons that people resist our faith, in fact, perhaps one of the reasons you resist our faith is you know what we believe. You know that we believe for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him not perish have eternal life and that salvation's free and it's a gift and it's grace and it's mercy. And you know that's what we believe, but you don't see us doing it, right? It's not that you don't believe what we believe. You're not convinced we believe what we believe. Your friends and neighbors and the people who resist Christianity, it's not that they don't know what you believe. From time to time, they look at us and they look at the church and they think, I wonder if they believe it. Because if their message is a message about reconciliation and God has reconciled the world to himself, I don't see it. So if that's our message, it must be reflected in our lives or we are what Jesus called us last time, not me, don't get mad at me. He says, you're hypocrites, we're hypocrites. So this isn't 201, 
This is Christianity 101. This is following Jesus. Because that was the first decision. The, the, the second decision I'm not gonna spend so much time on is I will own my slice of the blame pie. I will own my slice of the blame pie. I'm gonna look in the mirror and get the pie out of my eye. I got a little slice of pie in my eye. I thought the whole pie was in their face. There is pie in my eye. So Jesus said, you are gonna look in the mirror. Reassembly begins looking in the mirror and it begins with taking the plank out of your eye and my eye so that we, not that we'll be better people, that's not the end result. We're gonna take the little speck or the plank out of our eye so we can see clearly how to move efficiently in their Direction. So those are, the, those are the first two decisions. Today, number three and four, and I'll just let you know up front, these two decisions are things we've talked about throughout the series. I've just not asked you to decide them. I've sort of you know, dropped some breadcrumbs throughout our time together on this topic, hoping that when we got to this final episode, that you would have heard this so many times that you would be willing to commit, to decide about these two issues. Number three is this, I will make the first move. I will make the first move regardless of who moved away first. I will make the first move regardless of who's to blame, how much they're to blame, how much I'm to blame. I'm gonna make the first move regardless of who moved away first. And the reason, humanly speaking, you should do this is because the mature person in the relationship, we talked about this, the mature person in the relationship always makes the first move. And I know all of you well enough to know that you are the most mature person in the relationship, right? I mean, you're more mature than them, aren't you? I mean, when you tell your story to your friends and your family, don't you come off as the more mature one? When you rehearse the narrative in your mind, when I do, I always come off as the more mature one. In fact, when I rehearse those narratives in my mind, I always imagine there's a crowd around listening to me talk to this person. Do you ever do this? And then when you're finished, the crowd's like, oh, you're so wise, Yoda. I mean, oh my goodness, clearly, Andy, clearly it's not your fault. Right? When we rehearse those narratives. So if in your mind, you're right. If in your mind, you're more mature, good news, bad news. Good news, you're more mature. Bad news, it's your responsibility to make the first move. Now, this is so fascinating to me. I don't know if it will be to you or not. Jesus' most inconvenient command, not his most difficult perhaps or most complicated, but I think Jesus' most um, inconvenient command that he made during his time on earth goes right to this issue. Now, the problem with this command, it is so connected to Judean first century culture that when we read it, we're like, huh, and we just keep reading. I mean, there's, it just doesn't stick. It's not gritty. It just, you know, we, we just pass right by it. But I, I think that when Jesus said, when I'm about to read to you that he said, I think when he said this, I think there was an audible gasp in the audience like, what? I mean, you said some crazy things and some hard things, but this is just flat out, this is just flat out inconvenient. I mean, this is just undoable. Here's, here's what he said. He said, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and he's already lost us, like, what, what is he talking about? We don't, we don't do this. Okay, well, this isn't our world, right? Here, here's what he's talking about. He's referring to this very inconvenient, often long trek to Jerusalem, to the temple, to get in line at the altar to make a sacrifice at the altar. You had to take time off work. You got to drag the kids through the city. Sometimes you had to drag the kids to the city, the streets are narrow, it's dirty, it's just, it's just unimaginable. And he's like, if you've decided to make the long journey to Jerusalem and you're gonna make, you know, let it make a, an offering or present your gift at the altar. And, and the other thing is this, there's no fast pass, okay? And you can't even call ahead, you know, what's the wait? Three days, okay, three days, Frank's gonna be, you know, that we gotta get in line for three days, okay? You show up at the temple, you have no idea how long this is gonna take, how long the line is, the weather, you know, it changes all the time. It's, if you've been there, it's just so extraordinarily hot. So the, it was such an, un, it was a completely unpredictable environment. 
And Jesus is not referring to going to the temple to make a sacrifice for sin. He's very specific. This is a gift, which means this is someone who is on the up and up with God. This is someone who just wants to get closer to God, or this is someone who is very grateful for something God has done. And instead of just being grateful in their heart, they decide to make the effort to go to Jerusalem, sacrifice their time to make a sacrifice so that God will know how grateful they are for whatever it is has happened or whatever it is they believe God has done. So this is a good person going the extra mile. You know, I'm, I'm a model. I'm, you know, I'm a good example. I'm going to go to the temple and show my gratitude to God in a physical, tangible way. So therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and when you get there, and this could take days, after you've stood in line, you're standing there and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you and Jesus is intentionally ambiguous. He doesn't say whose fault it is. He doesn't explain what happened. He just says you're standing in line or you get there and you remember, oh yeah, that thing. She's so frustrated. Or, you know, I was, you know, what I said was so insensitive and they're just kind of spinning out there and I gotta, you know, all of a sudden you remember there's something big, there's something small, but there's something unresolved. And when he said this, his audience thought this, oh yeah, if I'm on my way to make a gift to God at the, at the, at the temple, and I remember that you know, I've got an unresolved relational thing at home, well, you know what? Not a problem, not a problem. I will finish my business with God, and then I will head on home, and I will do my best to kind of reconcile my brother or my sister and try to get that whole thing straightened out. So says compartmentalized vertical religion but not horizontal religion, Jesus. So says internalized religion, where I just forgive people on the inside and I thank God on the inside. It's all internalized. You know, me and God are good. How do you know? Well, just trust me, it's it's invisible. It's inside of me. Internalized religion. That's that's what internalized religion does. I'm gonna make things right with God, then, you know, I'll, I'll figure this out. But not real world, read the gospels, but not real world, earthy Earthy is the new holy, Jesus. So he takes a deep breath and he says, here it is, leave your gift there in front of the altar. They're like, wait, 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 what did he say? Did he say grieve? I think he said grieve. Did he say say leave? Leave, wait. It's taken me days. I got the kids. Everybody's whining and crying, and the, you know the goat. You know, we come in. I got the grain and the pigeons. You know, and this is a come on, Jesus. This is a very complicated ordeal. This is not a casual endeavor. Even getting there, and you're saying once I get there, I've waited in line. How many? You know, twenty. Now there's nineteen, eighteen. We're almost there. You know, will I be home for dinner? Will I ever be home? Will I be home before dark? And I realize there's an unresolved thing at home, and you want me to leave my gift. At the altar, do you realize that when I get back, my altar, my gift may be gone. My gift may have actually wandered off into the city. I'm supposed to leave my gift at the altar? He says, yeah, because you got things out of order. First, first of most importance, this is hard, of most importance, in other words, more important than what you came here to do. I want you to go back home and be reconciled to them. (laughs) They're looking at each other like, he has been out and has he ever even been to the, does he know what he's asking us to do? Here's what they heard, Jesus. You want us to put other people before God? I mean, you want me to put my sister, my brother-in-law, you mean to put that neighbor, that guy at work? Are you saying that I'm to put them before God? And Jesus will say, no. This is how you put God first, by reconciling with those God loves. You you put invisible God first by reconciling with the visible people in your life that have created so much chaos that you've hurt and they've hurt you back or they hurt you and you're not sure what to do. Jesus, and they're like, wait, no, no, this isn't how it works. God, we know, Jesus, we know how it works. God is first, people are second. Jesus is going, this is why I'm here. This is why I became one of you. This is why I spent three and a half years wandering around and teaching. 
You've watched me for three and a half years. Put other people first. Because in the kingdom of God, greatness in the kingdom of God is moving to the back of the line. Even the son of man, talking about himself, even the son of man didn't come to be served. Even the son of man didn't come to be first. But he came to give his life as a ransom for the many. So if you're gonna follow me, you gotta do what I do. And if you wanna honor God, just leave your gift right there and go be reconciled. That is more honoring to God than your gift of thanksgiving at the temple. You put invisible God first by reconciling with your brother, your sister, your neighbor, and then Jesus really stretches our imagination and by reconciling with your enemy. And then, he didn't leave him hanging, and then, you just come on back and offer your gift. We're like, okay, okay, can, can I ask you a question? Isn't it, isn't it enough to just to, for, to forgive them and then believe in you? I like internalized religion where I, in my mind, in my heart, I forgive them and I believe in you. Isn't that enough? And we know the answer to that because that's not what changed the world. That's not what shaped Western civilization. That's not what got the pagans attention in the first and second and the early third century. That's not what turned the value system of the Roman empire upside down, internal religion. I'm just gonna forgive you and believe in God, forgive you and believe in God. Jesus would say, no, that's not enough. Not if you're gonna follow me because internalized religion lets us all off the hook, right? And neither Jesus nor his brother James had anything good to say about that approach to faith, that approach to God, that approach to religion. Jesus is inviting us to a better way of living that would ultimately make the world a better place to live. It's it's a way to live out the essence of what we say we believe, that God so loved that he moved in our direction, that he, this is amazing, that he did not count your sins against you when it came to having a relationship with you. And he says to you, I want you to do that. And if you walked away from faith, chances are it's because perhaps somebody didn't do that. And you've wondered ever since, not if what we believe is true, but if we really believe it's true. Because nobody can see your heart. Nobody can see your faith. Nobody can feel your heart or your faith. They just see and feel the way they're treated by those of us who claim to be the messengers of reconciliation. Here's something to think about. Every time you pray, every time you pray, whether you're praying for yourself or somebody else, a health situation, financial situation, one of your children, um, anytime you pray, do you know what you're doing? Anytime you pray, you are leveraging and celebrating. You are leveraging and celebrating the fact that God not only forgave you, that he, but that he reconciled with you. Every single time you pray, you are assuming a relationship, not just stand off arm's distance forgiveness. Like, I don't know who those people are. I just wave my magic God wand. I just wave my magic God wand and just forgave them all. But I don't know, I don't, I don't have any interest in individuals. I just kind of forgave everybody. You know, they're, everybody's fine. You know, just don't bother me with the details. That's not what we find in the teaching of Jesus or the New Testament. So every time you come to God with a personal request, you are assuming, you are celebrating the fact that you have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. You are celebrating reconciliation. And if that's the case, why would we not, to the best of our ability, as far as it depends on us, lean in that direction with the people around us? I will make the first move regardless of who moved away first. The fourth and final decision, again, we've alluded to it all along. In fact, from the very beginning, is simply this. I will keep the door open and the welcome mat out. And I've said this is critical, but I haven't asked you to do it. I haven't asked you, I haven't asked you to decide to do this. That I will, in fact, keep the door open and the welcome mat out. Now, I will uncross my arms. And the reason this is so important is because for some people, and again, let me say this, 
If a person's unsafe, off, off limits, off base, right? If someone is unsafe physically or emotionally, that's a whole different thing. We're gonna take that off the table for just a minute. But that group of people or that person aside, this is a decision you have to make about those other people because, because the hits just keep on coming, don't they? For some people, this, you have to make this decision about them daily because stuff keeps happening. They keep doing that thing. They keep not showing up. They keep, you know, whatever it was that got this whole fire started, they keep fueling the fire and everything in you. And even common sense at times says, you know what? I tried and I'm done and I don't care anymore. And there may be somebody like that in your life that it is almost a daily decision. I am not closing the door and I'm not pulling in the welcome mat because my heavenly father never did that to me. And the goal is no regrets. And this decision will reduce your regret. This decision will keep you healthier. There will be less or no bitterness build up. This, this, this decision keeps our hurt, as we talked about last time, connected to the actual source. And it makes it difficult for us to transfer the hurt from one relationship to another relationship. But the moment you pull up the drawbridge, the moment you cross your arms, the moment you say, I'm done, I'm done, I'm, I don't care anymore. The moment you do that, you become a carrier and you're gonna carry that somewhere. So when you make this decision, this is a decision that helps keep you healthy. It certainly keeps the opportunity for the relationship open, but it helps you remain healthy. Let me just pry, like this is so meddling. I'll just acknowledge that up front. But for all of those of you who are married, is it possible if that your husband or your wife has suggested this and you went ballistic and they have never brought it up again, okay? Or they did it and they brought it up anyway. And every time they bring it up, it is like, it's just so off limits. It's such a wound. And you're, you're sure they are so wrong. So let me ask it. Is it possible, just possible, that your mom or your dad is haunting your marriage? Is it possible? Is it possible that something with your mom way back or your dad way back and there could be other people, but let's just focus there a minute. Is it possible that they're haunting your marriage because you got hurt and, in, and, and your hurt was genuine and your hurt was justified. And then you decided, well, I just don't care. And, and you pull the welcome mat in, you close the door. And consequently, you became a carrier because, I mean, we're, we're all susceptible to this. When core relationships break, when core relationships break, something on the inside of us breaks. And when we don't know what to do, we generally do all the wrong things. But now you know, now you know, now you know. And the question is, will you decide? Will you decide as far as it depends on me? Is it, is it far as, as far as I can go, as much as I can do, no regrets, no regrets, no regrets. I will, I will get back to, I will not get back at. I will not do what they've done to me and I will not look for a way to get back at them. That is off the table. And I will own my slice of the blame pie and it is a sliver of a sliver of a sliver, but yep, there is something I could have done that would have kept this from happening. There is something that I could have done that would have made this not as bad as it is. There is a response. I should, I'm gonna own my slice of the blame pie. And I'm gonna be the grown up. I'm gonna make the first move, regardless of the fact that they started this fire and they moved away first. And for the rest of my life, if I have to, I'm gonna keep the door open and I'm gonna keep the welcome mat out just like my heavenly father did for me. Now, as we close, I wanna say something specifically to those of you who are not Christians. Uh, maybe you used to be, uh, maybe you're reconsidering faith. Maybe if I, if I, I'm sure if I heard your story, I would probably abandon the faith too. I mean, you're smart, you're, you're, you're justified in your decisions, whatever your decision might be. But I wanna offer a specific invitation 
to you. And the reason, the reason I want to end here is because oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, oftentimes a broken relationship is the catalyst to a broken faith. Oftentimes, not all the times, a broken, close, important relationship or a broken relationship with another Christian is the catalyst. It's the fuel to a broken or an abandoned faith. And I'll be honest, that's difficult to admit. It's difficult to admit because you know the two are kind of mutually exclusive, but you can't help it. What happened in that relationship, it it didn't just destroy the relationship, it did something to your faith. It's difficult to connect those dots, but oftentimes those dots, they are in fact connected. So this is how I wanna close. As much as I hope that you'll reconcile with your father or your brother or your business partner or your neighbor or whoever it is that you need to reconcile with, as much as I hope that you'll reconcile with him, I want to plead with you to consider reconciling with your heavenly father. The apostle Paul felt the same way about a group of Gentiles that he loved in the city of Corinth. Listen to how he said it. He was so direct. And this is, this is for you. He said, I implore you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, not our behalf. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Would you consider, be reconciled to God who removed all the obstacles, who who does not count your sin against you. You count some of your sin against you. We all have a tendency to do that. Who does not count your sin against you. Who went looking for you, not to pay you back, but to get you back. Not to get back at you, but to get back to you. Because in spite of you, He loves you. Would you consider being reconciled to God? And if you do, either either now or later, or even never, we just want you to know that we're here for you. Because believe it or not, beginning with me, we all, we all have a reconciled with God story of our own. So I just wanna invite you to stop resisting, to stop rehearsing that narrative to get beyond what he did and beyond what she didn't do? And would you be reconciled to God? Heavenly Father, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you personally for not holding my sin against me because I maybe more than anybody in this room had no excuses because of how I was raised and what I knew. So Father, give each of us eyes to see the people around us the way that you see them. And whatever excuse we've been using and holding up, Father, I pray that it would fade when held up against the cross, that we would be wise, that we would be courageous, that we would keep those doors open, those welcome mats out, and that we would learn to do for others, even the difficult others, what you so graciously did for us. And we pray all of that in the matchless name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hey, we're just going to sing this song over you. So just take this time to meditate on those words, to maybe reconcile with your God. Maybe reconcile with something that's just been bothering you and give it to him. If you're troubled, heavy hearted, come to Jesus and find your peace. If you're on doubt, empty handed, come to Jesus and find your strength. He is home for the Lord.
Council or Prince of Peace Author and maker of everything Defender, deliverer, king of kings He is, he is Helper and healer forevermore Savior and shelter for every storm My refuge, redeemer and lord of lords He is, he is Child of heaven and son of man is so true our God he just wants to be reconciled to us to have a relationship with us the welcome mats out and you just got to come and knock on the door we're so glad that you joined us today we hope to see you next week we've got a special message with Andy he's going to be interviewing a guest speaker um, his name is Dr. Crawford Lawrence until then we hope you have a great weekend and we'll uh, let you go in peace see you